Well, hi, and welcome back to our Romans Bible study. We're going to finish Romans 12 today. I want to start off with, you guys are, are just blessing me more than I deserve, and I've got more gifts. Uh, believe it or not, for all the pestering I give to the wordy one, she got me this very nice mug that says hope. Hope is the anchor for the soul. Um, and it's, it's her favorite verse, and it's a wonderful verse and a wonderful mug full of delicious coffee. I might have shown this last week, but this is another gift I got that says chosen to be a Calvinist. <laughs> Love it. And I also got a matching t-shirt to boot. You folks have been treating me like it's Christmas every week, and that's certainly not necessary. And oh, by the way, uh, when I stepped up into the pulpit to preach uh, on Sunday, I found this shirt in a bag, says Pastor Kevin on it, which is very nice. And on the back, as you can see, it says Jesus Nerd. And I are one, so <laughs> I love it. Um, and I love being a Jesus nerd. If there's anything to be nerdy about, um, I suppose a good way of talking about being a nerd is someone, someone who is obsessed with, uh, something. So being obsessed with Jesus, I think would be, I think that's okay. So, <laughs> so very thankful. You, all of you are such a blessing to me. Your answers are a blessing to me. And I'm hoping in some, some way possible that this, Bible study today will be a blessing to you. And so we're just going to go ahead and, and get started here. We're talking about showing love. And, and in these last few chapters of Romans, as we discussed last week, Paul gives practical instruction, kind of the, kind of the hands-on aspect of doing, doing church stuff. And I think this is an area that's so important because it's easy for us to read books, read scripture, uh, we can find all out, all about God and and how He has revealed Himself in His Word. We can read great people who have also discovered many things about Him, and and there are probably particular theologians that you cherish and are special to you. Mine are guys like R.C. Sproul, uh, John MacArthur, Alistair Begg. Go back to John Calvin, Martin Luther, Charles Spurgeon. You know, and, and we can read all of those things, and they're wonderful things. And we can even read Scripture, and that's the most important thing for us to read and to understand. But if we don't live it out, it doesn't really matter. When, when you mistreat your neighbor, he doesn't question you about what theologians are your favorite. <laughs> he says, I thought you said you were a Christian. Ouch. You see, this idea of showing love is... It's kind of hard, isn't it? Uh, one thing I can imagine this week as you delved into these questions, as you read the text of Romans 12, 9 through 21, you probably discovered that this stuff is not easy. In fact, I, I'd like to start off by kind of establishing this, uh, this idea of love is, it's hard. It's difficult. You know why? Because we got to love people like us. <laughs> Ouch, that hurt too, didn't it? Um, I probably think I'm really lovable, but see, some of you already know me and you know that I'm not always so lovable. And, you know, we tend to be okay loving those who love us back, but those people are pretty hard to find, aren't they? And it could just be that we ourselves are maybe not so lovable, probably not as lovable as we think we are. Um, I just read a, a quote I put on Facebook this week. Charles Spurgeon, you know, was saying, if somebody uh, points out an area of, of weakness in you or uh, something where you're failing, don't be upset at him. You're probably failing even worse than what he's mentioned. <laughs> probably so. Jesus himself said that we would be known as his disciples because of our love one for another. Again, he didn't say you'll, you'll be known as my disciples, because you've broadcasted to everyone that you have the right theology, even though you should. <laughs> but rather, the absolute tangible way that people can know that you belong to Christ is that you love one another. And so we are instructed to love. And I think it's important to, to start off by establishing we're instructed to love, not to feel. Some of us will say, well, I'll act 
in love when I feel love. If you've been married long enough, you've probably discovered feelings of love can be fleeting. If you were to wait until you felt like loving your spouse, you might never. Don't be offended. Think about that. One thing that you learn if you've been at it long enough is that you choose to love that person even when you'd probably rather smash them in the head with a frying pan, right? You choose to love even when you don't feel it and it pays dividends and oftentimes feelings follow the action of love. But the important thing to understand here is that we are instructed and admonished to act loving. There's going to be times that God is going to call you to do loving actions towards your brother or sister in Christ. And that call of obedience is not contingent upon them being lovable. And it also is not promised that you'll get warm fuzzies when you do it. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and read our text and get involved here. Romans 12. We're going to start off by looking at verses 9 through 16. Paul says, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. I love that verse, by the way, outdo one another in showing. It doesn't, he doesn't say show one another honor. He says outdo each other. <laughs> I, I can see Paul kind of smiling and, uh, as, as he writes those words. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Boy, what a, what a pause there, isn't it? Amidst giving this, he reminds us, we're serving the Lord in all this. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and to seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. So how many of you are 10 out of 10 on all these instructions? Yeah, me either. <laughs> uh, there are instructions given here in these verses that quite frankly seem impossible. I, I think if you... If you are really honest about it and you're really serious about what's being asked of you in these verses, I don't think any of us could say, yeah, I'm doing that uh, 10 out of 10. Uh, every, every time that I'm faced with loving my enemy, I just, man, I just pour the love on. Uh, when, when I'm supposed to bless and not curse, I don't curse at all. I think of... Uh, now everybody's wearing these, you know, face masks because of coronavirus. And I, I think sometimes I wonder what people are saying behind those masks while they're, you know, muttering to themselves around the grocery store or Lowe's or Walmart or wherever, wherever it is that you're allowed to be. And what's, I, I can't see their lips moving, so I have no idea, but I wonder how many people are being cursed not blessed on the, other, on the other side of that mask. Just a thought. Um, you read these instructions that Paul gives, and if you're like me, you're overwhelmed. I mean, this is, this is crazy stuff. And in fact, it's, it's the kind of actions that are counter, completely counter to our natural born tendencies, right? We are rebels to the core rebels against God's law at, at, our, at our root. And so our natural tendency is to go against what God wants. This stuff is completely against what our natural bent is. We don't want to, to bless those who curse us. We want to retaliate not only with an equal curse, but we want to one-up them and curse them just a little more than they cursed me. Right? This idea of genuine love, abhorring evil, loving with brotherly affection. Who, who does that? Now, that's a serious question. Who does that? Who abhors evil? Who loves with brotherly affection? Who, who has genuine love? Who does that? God does. 
Those are divine characteristics. And we cannot accomplish what is being asked of us in Romans 12 on our own. We can't accomplish those things in our family, much less in the church or even in the world that we live in. We, were, we are going to have to depend upon God himself in order to accomplish these commands. But I just want to tell you, that's the case with everything that he tells us to do. We can't do, do what he calls us to do without him doing it through us. I've had people say, well, I just can't forgive that person. I'm like, and, and yet they know that God calls them to. And I've said, you're right, you can't forgive them. But God can through you. And so it really is a, an issue of us relying upon God to do what he has asked us to do as he gives us the enabling, the empowering by his spirit to do those things he asked us to do. So just want you to keep that in mind as you look at these very challenging and difficult tasks that you're asked to do. Remember that you are not left alone in doing these things but the Holy Spirit that he has placed inside you to encourage you, to comfort you, to empower you. He gives that Holy Spirit so that you can do those things that he calls you to do. All right, we got a question here. First discussion question. What expressions of love do we find in verses 9 through 16? All right. Expressions of love. I'm paraphrasing a bit here. Let love be without hypocrisy, abhorring evil and embracing good. Be kind and love each other as brothers and sisters. Not being lazy when called to serve. I like that a lot. That's excellent. Not being lazy when called to serve. Rejoicing because we know we have hope, but being patient when trials come and pray always. Giving to the saints in a practical manner. Be compassionate with those who are happy and those who are sad. Stay humble. And do not hurt those who have hurt you. Allow God to be in control and try and overcome evil with good. And I think one of the key things in, in this excellent answer is this idea of allowing God to be in control. That's how we're going to accomplish these things that, that really are only accomplished by one who is divine. So we need to allow him to be God in us and through us in order to do these things that he's called us to do. Excellent answer. All right. To me, the whole section is a love letter to us from Jesus. I mean, really think about what is being said here. If we, all who believe, could keep only one third of what is written here on a consistent basis, the whole world would look a whole lot different. I could not agree more. And the reality is we can't even, we can't even accomplish a third of it. But you're absolutely right. Imagine if we could, imagine how different the world would be. What, what if we were all humble and blessed those who cursed us? I think people might have a heart attack. I've, I, they would die of shock. <laughs> um, being diligent in serving the Lord. Wow. Non-believers would be so attracted to us and the hope that lies within us. The ultimate love letter. A map of how we ought to live and serve others to forward the kingdom of Jesus. Such a great answer. And and I love how uh, you brought out this whole idea of even if we could even accomplish a third of this, a fraction of this, the difference it would make in people's lives. All right. What an excellent answer. I appreciate that. I've got another question here. Thoughtfully consider your church. Uh, which of these expressions of love do you regularly see there? All right. And I know we have people in various churches represented here. So um, consider these, as you're listening to this, you know, you may be part of a different church. So consider, consider these questions in, in relation to your own church situation. Which of these expressions of love do you regularly see at your church? Very interesting, thought-provoking question. I can only answer from my personal perspective. Like observing through a small pinhole in a spyglass. I do not see the whole picture. I mean, what a great response. And we're not even done with the answer here, but we are limited in our own personal vision, aren't we? We see some things, but there's some aspects of what people do. There are things that people do that are expressions of love in our churches, and they have not let anybody know that it was them that did it. They've taken no credit. They've humbly served. And so, you know, we, we see some of these things, but... There are things that happen uh, behind the scenes that 
never gets any ne necessarily any notice. So I like this idea of uh, viewing like a like through a pit, small pinhole in a spyglass. I know God and the Holy Spirit are at work in ways I may not know or see. I see a generous spirit, a willingness to give financially toward a cause, a needy brother or missions. I've seen members cook meals for shut-ins or others in need. I feel strong prayer warriors at work. I know I have benefited from them. I see brotherly love for one another. We just went through an 18 month process of finding a pastor. So I know God is at work here. Love is evident. Uh, that poor church and uh, I feel sorry for them because I know the pastor they got. <laughs> um, I will say that I agree with these things that are mentioned these wonderful expressions of love and the fact that you've put up with your new pastor for lo these uh, eight months, almost nine months here goes, goes well along the way of <laughs> describing you as a loving group of people. All right. Another answer. I think the church that lets me associate with them is particularly excellent at verse 16, associating with the lowly. My church family is also wonderful at service helping to meet the needs of others and showing hospitality. Huh, that was a particularly brief answer. Written by the previously extra wordy one, temporarily being not so wordy, but probably being wordy in the future. Now that's wordy. <laughs> All right, good answer. And you know, the, the reality is, and I, I love, I love self-deprecation because I'm all about that as well associating with the lowly, uh, as I said, the, the same church that the wordy one is describing is one that's put up with me. And so that means they associate with the lowly if they associate with me and the wordy one. All right. Sorry, here we go. Uh, which of these expressions of love need to be more apparent in your church? All right, so these are those areas that need a little <laughs> need a little work. We need to be better at seeking to understand and empathize with others. It is so easy to stand back and judge others without understanding why they might be acting in ways that just don't seem to make sense to us. I'm gonna stop right there. That is so well said. We see that person has the, the child that's acting out and we wonder if that mom is paying attention and how dare she bring that kid disrupting the service and we don't know that she's struggling with a broken relationship and maybe news that she just, you know, came down with a, with a cancer and maybe her mother died or something. There's, there's a, oftentimes more to the story and we just want to cast a negative glance at somebody or whatever, and we don't know their whole story. I, I really love this idea of understanding, empathizing more. Empathy is allowing yourself to consider why a person's life experiences could lead them to act that way. When you have a clearer understanding, you may be able to offer comfort and helpful Bible-based guidance. Too often we find it to be more entertaining to discuss them behind their backs, gossiping, and make no effort to understand or help. And I, I it's so true. And I think too, uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? That's an old expression, but it's so true. We need to demonstrate that we genuinely love and care about people, no matter what they're going through. And even no matter how they're acting, we need to let them know that regardless of how they are, we love them. Even if they're cursing us, we're to bless them and not to curse them back, right? Next answer. Probably we could do more outreach activities in the community or to some of our shut-in members. They probably have needs at home that a group of us could help them with. Absolutely. And you know, sometimes we, we make ministry really complicated and we have to have a committee and we have to have this and we have to, sometimes it's a simple matter of, hey, where, what's the need? Oh, you need someone to cook meals for it. All right, let's go do that. There's a ministry, right? <laughs> All right. Um, we know that all of us struggle to love the way that Paul describes here. It's, it's not going to be easy. I want to emphasize that. And it's not intended to be easy. And it's not intended to be something that you can do in your own strength. I believe that God allows all of these different things to come into our life that he calls us to do to point us to him, 
to, to bring us to a place where we rely completely on his strength and on his power. He wants us to not be Lone Ranger Christians, but rather be the kind of Christians that say, yep, I can't do anything on my own. Not one single thing can I do on my own. I need you, Lord Jesus, in every aspect of my life, including all of these things that he's called us to do. One of the main reasons that people will reject the gospel is that they've met Christians. I don't, I don't want that to be said of us. So we, we, need to, we need to truly allow Christ to live through us. And, you know, what a wonderful church experience we would have if people love the way Paul instructs us to love. That can only happen as we depend on the power of Christ in us. All right, let's go ahead and read the, the remainder of our passage here, Romans 12, 17 through 21. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, it's interesting. Verse 17 mentions do not. In fact, there's, there's these, there's several do not verses in, these, in this last part of the scriptures here. And I just want to say, I don't think any of us like it when some do not, right? Tell your kid, do not cross the street. What do they want to do now? They didn't have any desire to go across the street five minutes ago, but guess where they want to go now? Across the street. Why? Because you said do not. <laughs> uh, there's, <laughs> there's something wired in us. It's that rebellion, that sinful nature that wants to defy God's law. God says, do not. And we say, oh, well, that's what I do want to do now. <laughs> we, we don't like those words, do not. Our, our natural heart of rebellion despises being told what not to do. And perhaps if you're honest, you've struggled with some of the do nots found in your scriptures, in your Bible. We don't like it. And I'll be honest, most of those things that we're told not to do, I've got a problem with. I want to act out in vengeance. I don't like to hear, do not repay evil for evil. I don't <laughs> I want to come fire right back at you. I want to curse those who persecute me. I want to do that. Maybe you don't. I don't believe you. <laughs> I want to repay evil for evil. Is, is anybody following me along here today? I don't want to follow the do nots. I want to do the do nots. <laughs> I want to repay evil for evil. I want to curse those who curse me. But I need to submit my way to the Lord's way, don't I? It's difficult. It's very difficult. Paul follows each use of the phrase do not with what we are to do. In view of these instructions, how are we to deal with people who might otherwise be our enemies? This is, this is good information to find out. I find in these very troubling times we need to honestly show that we care. And words are not enough. So often our words say one thing, but our actions are completely opposite. I again refer back to love must be shown without hypocrisy. We are so concerned about what everyone else is doing or not doing. We forget the guidance in verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Vengeance is the Lord's. Let's leave it to him. I mean, such a profound answer. Absolutely. And yet it's not easy, is it? As far as it depends on you, live peaceably. Let me tell you something. In most instances, it does depend on you. <laughs> it depends completely on you. The ball's in your court. You have an opportunity to live peaceably or to stir up more trouble. Like one answer said here a few minutes ago, we like to pass judgment on somebody. We like to talk about them. We like to gossip about them behind their backs. We don't actually like to genuinely show love and care and support for them. And in those instances, does it depend on us to live peaceably? Mm-hmm. Do we do it? Mm-hmm. Vengeance is the Lord's. Let's leave it to him.
you know, we, we, we sometimes think we do such a better job uh, distributing the vengeance. It's not our department. All right? Um, now, I found it fascinating, and I imagine some of you might have noticed this verse here. It says that we, by doing the right thing, we will heap burning coals on our enemy's head. Now, <laughs> I think what we want to do is forget to do the right thing. How about I just go get some charcoal, light it on fire, and dump it on my enemy? Because that sounds a whole lot more appealing than what's actually being talked about here. <laughs> You're probably wondering what in the world that means. So I have a quote here from John MacArthur, which I thought might be helpful. Um, but first, I'm going to give the second answer, which for some reason I didn't read. I apologize. Hang on. So let me go back here. The question is, Paul follows each use of the phrase, do not with what we are to do instead. In view of these instructions, how are we to deal with people who might otherwise be our enemies? And the second response was, I would imagine we could quickly acquire enemies if we do what Paul says we should not do here. Now that's a fact. Repaying evil with evil and avenging our own wrongs is the fast lane to making enemies. Yes, it is. Thankfully, Paul has other recommendations on what we should be doing. Paul's instruction involves us showing kindness and mercy toward our enemies. Paul quotes from Proverbs 25 in feeding our hungry and thirsty enemies. I don't think he necessarily means this in a literal sense, but you get the idea of caring for those that we may not like so much. Overall, we need to do what is right and honorable in our interactions with others, friends and enemies alike. Absolutely. And caring for those who we know they don't deserve it, and they're probably not even going to be grateful and so on and so forth. And we have all of our excuses, right? We're to do it anyway. And the fact is, when we compare it to our own selves, we should realize that we don't deserve any goodness or kindness our way either, right? All right, now, let's go back to this idea of burning coals. I have a John MacArthur quote here for you. He said, heaping burning coals on his head. This refers to an ancient Egyptian custom in which a person who wanted to show public contrition carried a pan of burning coals on his head. I don't recommend that in a literal sense. Somebody's going to get hurt. The coals represented the burning pain of his shame and guilt. When believers lovingly help their enemies, it should bring shame to such people for their hate and animosity. All right, so... I think a lot of times we see people people act in a hateful way. They know they're, they know they're being hateful. They're not surprised. They're not surprising themselves. They know they're being hateful. They know, they know they're being jerks. And in fact, they probably enjoy doing so. All right? We don't necessarily need to tell them what a jerk they are. If we will turn around and just be loving towards them, they're going to be like, oh my goodness, I acted like that and they just treated me with love? It has a way of melting people's hearts. It has a way of bringing them to a place where they begin to, to deal with their own issues. Uh, but I, I love that little illustration. I don't want anybody to try this out on your own time and get a you know, a pan out of the oven and charcoal from, from where you keep your grill and don't do that, okay? I don't need lawsuits, emails, text messages, okay, right? All right. I don't need any burning coals for Jesus. All right, last question. It is easy, almost natural to be overcome by evil. We simply join what is going on around us. How might following the principles in this passage lead us instead to overcome evil? All of these things should give us pause when we get caught up in the evil of the world. It is hard right now to not let the anger out, not let, let the fear make you ugly when you speak to someone, not want to help anyone because you think it will be thrown back in your face. We need to remember how good we feel when we fellowship with the saints, when we help one another, when we come alongside someone who is struggling and we empathize with their battles. I love it. Here's this word, empathize again. Um, very awesome. You know, 
this, there's some good points being brought out in this answer. We, I think in this world, we're, sometimes we're afraid if I do the right thing, it's going to be, it's not going to be appreciated or it's not going to be, they're going to question my motives anyway. Oh, you're just doing this so you can get it. Friends, we need to do the right thing as unto the Lord. You remember in this passage, we looked when we started out here, Paul reminds us you're serving the Lord and not about you. And maybe they will uh, reject your offer and maybe they'll question your motivations. You're serving the Lord, so serve the Lord. That's the admonition here. We need to remember who we're serving. We're not serving ourselves. And so that's a really important aspect. All right. Second answer. As a veteran of war, and I just want to say, <laughs> just pause here. Tony, thank you so much for your service to our country. We love and appreciate that. As a veteran of war, I find it so easy to give in to hate, to tear people down. That's the easy path that leads to destruction. But doing a 180 degree turn, what can someone say to you when they have wronged you real bad, expecting you to react and rip them apart and instead you show them love? You repay evil with good, unmerited grace. Jesus showed it to me when he forgave all of my grievous sins. How can I not in turn show it to others? <laughs> Jackpot. I'll read that again. Jesus showed, showed grace to me when he forgave all of my grievous sins. How can I not in turn show it to others? Absolutely right. People nowadays expect evil for evil. Love can melt the hardest hearts and the strongest men, for I am living proof. Like Paul, I am the chief of sinners. I'm the least. And yet, while I was still dead in my sins, Jesus still died for me. A king died for me. A debt I can never repay. <laughs> that touches my heart. That was a great answer. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, you think of that. Uh, I'm thinking uh, on, on spur of the moment here. I'm thinking of the song that uh, I owed a debt I could not pay. Um, he, he paid a debt he did not owe. I needed someone to wash my sins away. I'm probably getting the words wrong, but you know, Jesus didn't have to do anything for us. And yet he gives us his grace, his kindness, his mercy. We don't deserve it. That's the model. That's the pattern for us and how we are supposed to in turn treat others. All right. I've got one final question here. In what practical ways might this passage from Romans 12 help you to obey Christ's command to love your enemies, do good to those who hate you? All right. It's not easy to love those who have wronged you, who hate you, whether it be for your skin, your culture, the God you worship, or merely because you breathe. Carrying around hate is a burden. It makes us weary and affects who we are as God's children. When our response is love, how can it not be anything but a positive reaction? It may only be inward. Maybe it's for those taking mental notes. Maybe it happens years later for that person. What I know is God is not wrong. His word is perfect, but it is also not easy to love my enemies. That is all true. This is where having communion with God makes loving my enemies easier because I rely on him to guide me. There it is. We rely on him. Psalm 5, 3, in the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. Excellent answer. And one final answer. Romans 12 helps me correct my vision, my eye problem, and my heart through the eye glasses of Jesus. I'm telling you I love this stuff. I now see my enemies, my brothers, as Christ saw me, helpless, wretched, and condemned. I can and I must sincerely love my enemies as Jesus loves me. I can and I must bless them and not curse them. I can and I must rejoice with them and weep with them. I can and I must feed them when they are hungry. I can and I must give them something to drink when they are thirsty. I can and I must do all this because I can and I must do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see the encouragement in scripture right there? We talked from the beginning about how this is all impossible for us to do, all this that is asked of us, except that not only we can, but we must. Why? 
because we are given all that we need through Christ who strengthens us. Can we do it in ourselves, in our own power, in our own ability? No. <laughs> Can't do it at all. These relationships that we're a part of, they're hard, they're difficult, they're challenging because they involve people who aren't interested in them. <laughs> How can you help someone who is struggling? How can you more effectively rely upon the power of God? That's a question for all of us, right? How do I live out that Philippians 14, 4, 4 verse 13, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Daily, hourly, moment by moment, we need to come to him and be in constant communion with him and saying, Lord, I can't do this. I can't do another, I can't take another step in my own strength, but I'm coming to you now asking, you would give me the strength that I need. All right. That's Romans 12, or at least how we've tackled it today. <laughs> I hope you've been blessed. Let's go ahead and um, take a look at next week. Romans 13, 1 through 14. That's where we'll be. Romans 13. I want you to read that chapter. It's 14 verses. You'll enjoy it. And here are the questions. Dun, da, da, da. What was the attitude toward government in the home where you grew up? Oh boy, we're going to get some answers on this. Don't worry about it. The reason, we're, the reason we're tackling these questions is because that's what Romans 13 talks about, is kind of the relationship of the Christian and the government. So don't be alarmed, we'll get through it. Number two, read Romans 13, 1 through 7, verse 1 says that we are to submit to governing authorities. Why? <laughs> it's a good question, isn't it? Find all that you can in verses 1 through 7. Number three, no government is perfect, and some governments are cruel and corrupt. If you were under, under a cruel and corrupt government, how could you follow the underlying principles of Romans 13 and still do what is right? No love is perfect, not even love for ourselves. Even so, how can the admonition, love your neighbor as yourself, lead us toward a godly expression of love? Okay. Number five, according to Romans 13, 11 through 14, how are we to prepare ourselves for Christ's return? And I do pray that that's soon. Amen. Number six, what are some ways that you can clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ? Verse 14. All right, so those are your discussion questions. Read Romans 13, answer those six questions. And we'll be back at this next week. Uh, wanted to just also let you know, I have put up on the Romans uh, Facebook page a link where I have all of the videos of the entire study that we've done up until this point are on a YouTube channel designated for that. So if you wanted to perhaps view some older sessions or maybe you want to share that link with someone else who hasn't been able to be a part of the study and you think they may be benefited by it please do please share that link generously and liberally to as many friends or enemies huh see what i did there applied what we learned today share with your enemies some of these videos <laughs> i might make them even more mad who knows all right so <laughs> now you have your assignment for next week to all of you who have participated, thank you so much. You bless me more than you have any notion. I am so uh, privileged to be able to do this study and to have you all be a part of it. Until next time, thank you and God bless you.